Hey friends, this video is a suggestion from one of my Ableton course students, and it's also a follow-up on my last video on how the marketing hustle from plugin developers is convincing people that they need external plugins when they really just don't. Now it's rare, but in this video we're going to go over the rare cases in which there are plugins that actually do novel and useful things that Ableton or many other DAWs don't do natively, or at least they don't do it as well. The running theme though that you're going to notice here is that you don't need any of these plugins to make chart topping or really, really good modern mixes. But they're certainly nice to have and in many cases they can speed up your workflow. Now the whole reason I'm doing this series is to help you save money, so definitely watch all the way till the end because there's some very valuable information that can save you cash here. So if you're deeply into Ableton, this specific video is my short list of plugins that I believe really help round out the powerhouse that Ableton is. Cool. Let's get into it. Okay, so I've gone over Track Spacer before. Essentially, it's a side-chained dynamic EQ, which is a really powerful thing that Ableton doesn't have built into the software. A lot of the time, though, people will use this for side-chain ducking of a bass when you have a kick drum or some sort of side-chain situation. And sometimes, it's really, really awesome. And in other cases, it really, really isn't. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at different setups where Track Spacer is actually a better solution and where it actually isn't. Let's check it out. Okay, so the first thing to understand is that this mix is very, very, very loud. It's very limited, okay? And I'm doing this on purpose to illustrate the point that I'm about to show you, all right? So, there's going to be some distortion between the kick and the bass line here. Take a listen. We can hear that kind of sound whenever the kick and the bass are hitting at the same time, right? So we obviously have to duck the bass out of the way when the kick drum hits. Now I've got track spacer here and we can see that we have fed it the this drum track here and we fed it the uh, kick drum pre-effect signal, okay? So it will duck out of the way whenever the kick drum hits, but take a listen. Now. It is getting the bass out of the way when the kick drum hits, but we can hear a little bit of clicking in the uh, stereo field. Now, if you're listening with headphones, you really can hear this. This is subtle, but it's happening, okay? And to me, this isn't an acceptable solution. Now, believe it or not, Ableton's compressor in a sidechain setup similar to Track Spacer will actually do, in my opinion, a better job. Let's go ahead and take a listen to the difference. So here's Ableton's compressor. Clean as a whistle. That is about as clean as you could get right there when it comes to a side chaining situation. Now, sometimes track spacer is actually a better kick and bass side chain solution, but in this specific case, I gotta say, Ableton's compressor is cleaner. So let's go ahead and, and bounce back and forth between these using my Q key trick. So I just mapped a the Q, letter Q, to each one of these. And so when I hit it, I'm gonna bounce back and forth between these. Okay, so here's track spacer. Just a little bit of clicky sound right at the beginning of there, okay? Now, I don't want you to get the impression that Track Spacer is not a good plugin. In fact, it's one of my favorite plugins. It's incredible. But in this specific situation, it would be better served for what it's actually designed to do. And what it's designed to do is it's designed to listen to an incoming signal and then duck the track that it's sitting on based on the incoming information. On this track, I have another bass line. And <laughs> maybe this isn't the best compositional idea, but essentially if you have a track where you have instruments making a similar amount of energy along the frequency spectrum in the same place, okay, this is where track spacer can really shine. Let's say, for example, that this bass line in track two, I really want this to be the foundation of my track. I want this track to comprise of the sub and everything else. But when I add this bass, this bass also has sub information in it. And I don't want to take the sub information out when this bass is out of there. So let's go ahead and listen to what happens when I add this bass on top of this bass and the problems that can occur. Take a listen. So now not only does this sound less intelligible, right? But I'm also asking my limiter to do a lot. I'm like, all right, limiter, you're going to get two different tracks with sub bass in them, like deal with this, right? And of course, we're going to get distortion, right? 
Now, this is where track spacer really shines. I've fed this baseline into this baseline, okay? And now, whenever this baseline is firing at the same time as this baseline, it's not going to remove all the information, okay? The only thing that track spacer is going to remove is the frequency content of this track. So this baseline actually has more bright top end in it. So now listen to the difference. This is so cool. Did you hear how in this section right here, we could hear the sub from this red track here. We could still hear the sub. Okay, but when we were up here, all we could hear is kind of the high pass or the top section of this bass, right? So you can see where the use case of track spacer really shines, and that's when you have two tracks that are conflicting over the same frequency range, okay? Now, could you do this with Ableton? Of course you could. You could get in there with an EQ and you could make some automation where it pulls the low end out and then puts it back in. But is this a fast solution? No. Is this something that you can get done quickly? Absolutely not. And that's why track spacer is so useful. Cool? Awesome. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is limiting. If you go onto like audio forums, you'll see people asking questions that say something like, I've heard Ableton's limiter is bad. Why is it bad? And <laughs> the answers are really funny and they're always very vague, okay? I, it seems like people don't really understand why Ableton's limiter leaves a bit to be desired and that's what I said in my last video. Ableton's limiter is actually amazing for the resources that it uses. But yes, there are actually better limiting solutions that have some options that allow you to shape the way that the limiter works in ways that Ableton's limiter just can't do. Now, in my opinion, the last word in limiting has got to be FabFilters Pro L2. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at why it's kind of a step up in limiting when it comes to options, okay? Let's check it out. Okay, so I've got a Pro L2 here and an Ableton limiter. If I hit my V key, I can bounce back and forth between these two limiting solutions, right? Now, I have added in Pro L2 12 decibels of gain, and this is Pro L's vanilla setting, right? This is the setting that it has when you load it up. Now, this is Ableton's vanilla setting, except I've made the ceiling negative one, and as you can see in Pro L, the ceiling is also negative one. Now, I'm driving these limiters pretty hard because I really want to stress test them, okay? So let's go ahead and listen to the difference when I go back and forth between these two limiters, all right? So here's the Pro L2. Okay, so if you're listening to this on your phone or maybe on your laptop speakers, you might not have been able to hear a difference between Pro L2 and Ableton's limiter. If you're listening with headphones or on a better system, you can tell that Ableton's limiter is causing a little bit of distortion. But here's the thing, if it's hard to hear that Ableton's limiter is not as nice as Pro L2, then that's just, to me, that's got to speak to the quality of Ableton's limiter because if you hover over the title bar, look at this thing. 2.9 milliseconds of latency, okay? And if you hover over the Pro L2, we can see 66.4 milliseconds of processing latency. Essentially, the look ahead time or the plug and delay that Ableton's limiter needs to do what it does versus Pro L2 is very, very low, okay? So if you're in a club and you're listening to this limiter, I don't know if you're ever really gonna be able to hear this difference. Now, it is significant though. There is a significant difference and I would never wanna use Ableton's limiter for recorded music, okay, if I'm mastering something, right? It's just causing too much distortion when I'm driving it hard. Okay, so that's the first thing I wanna point out. The next thing that I wanna point out though is that I've got this mix pretty well prepared for a limiter. Like this mix is setting these limiters up for success. Let's go ahead and remove the safeguard though. On the drum track, I have an Ableton saturator. Yet again, with the high quality switch turned off, so no oversampling, and I'm using it in analog clip mode to clip and basically make it so that the drums aren't making too much peak signal. Now check this out. I'm gonna turn this off. We're gonna go back to the master, and what you're gonna hear is that Pro L2 is a lot more tolerant of a mix that is being fed into it that's not setting it up for success, whereas Ableton's limiter is really gonna have trouble with this mix that's not setting it up for success. Okay, so take a listen. Oh. 
So now we can really hear Ableton's limiter very much struggling with this material. And that's why it's so important, regardless of what limiter you're using, that you're setting that limiter up for success by controlling your peak signal. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn this saturator back on and let's go ahead and look at something else. So I'm gonna go back over to Pro L2. Now that I've got this up, we can look at the differences between both of these limiters. We can see that Ableton's limiter allows you to have a release time, and right now I'm using the auto mode. So if I were to switch over to Ableton's limiter and turn off auto, I can now dial in the release time. So what is release time? Essentially, every single time the threshold of the limiter is passed, it takes a certain amount of time for the limiting to get back up to zero, okay? A limiter essentially is in a lot of ways a clipper, okay? But the difference between a limiter and a clipper is that the limiter has a release time. A clipper has instant release time, okay? So any distortion or a clipper that you're using will simply go back up to zero instantly, whereas the limiter, you can dial this in. So as I pull the release time back, you're gonna hear the mix get louder. Check it out. So I'll start with a pretty long release time. Now, with a low release time, we've got a pretty loud mix, but again, there's a little bit of distortion in this limiter. If I switch over to Pro L2 though, check this out. Listen to how much more tolerant Pro L2 is when it comes to being able to dial in these controls. So real quick, if you're enjoying this video and you enjoy my teaching style, I actually have four super robust Ableton courses that you can take. Songwriting and composition, mixing and mastering, sound design, and live performance, all focused around Ableton Live. Each one of these courses is over 25 hours of video content just like this. If you want to learn more about that, you can actually take a free webinar that I've created and I'm going to link it up here. Awesome. Let's get back to it. Now, another thing I want to point out is that Pro L2 has an attack. So Ableton's limiter doesn't even have this parameter, okay? You can't adjust the attack time on Ableton's limiter. It essentially is set. Whereas on Pro L2, you can dial this in. And so what is nice about attack is it actually can help you shape the way that the limiting actually sounds, okay? So if we want a more splatty kind of sound, we can turn the attack down. Take a listen to this now. Let me go ahead and open the release time up so we'll get a little bit less distortion. We've got kind of that like Nine Inch Nails closer kind of sound on the drums, right? It sounds a little bit more splatty, right? If I pull the attack up though, what we're gonna get is a louder mix because we're allowing more of that signal to pass through. And I should say something else. All limiters that you use are gonna be clipping to some degree, okay? And the reason is, is because if you have attack time up, Essentially what you're saying is you're saying, okay, limiter, you can let 233.5 milliseconds of the signal through before the threshold pushes the signal down. And so what happens to that first 233.5 milliseconds? It gets clipped, okay? So essentially, if you don't have a high quality clipper, you're also gonna run into a, an issue where you're gonna get distortion. So Pro L2 allows you to deal with that distortion by dialing in the right amount of attack. Okay, so as I pull attack up, take a listen to how much louder, especially the transients will get in this beat. So think about the big difference there. I actually would have to mix my drums maybe a little bit differently if I had my attack up this high versus if I had my attack down here, right? This is a really big control and it's a tonal shaper, okay? It's really important for you to understand that this is, as far as I'm concerned, is a really necessary control for detailed limiting, okay? Now, the next thing I want to look at is that we have these different algorithms here. FabFilter Pro L2 has all these different algorithms that you can choose, and these are vastly program dependent. What does that mean? That essentially means that different styles of music will benefit from different styles of limiting, okay? Essentially, what we're choosing here is not only the way that the audio is handled, but also, uh, yeah, the way that the audio actually ends up getting clipped. Because again, a, a limiter can be a clipper and will be a clipper depending upon your attack release times, your look ahead times and everything else, okay? So let's go ahead and switch over to aggressive mode. And what this is gonna do is this is gonna add a little bit more of that audible kind of soft sign distortion to everything. And it's gonna get a little bit more of an aggressive sound, but maybe that's what you're going for. Here's an EDM kind of sound, right? So maybe we want a more aggressive limiting. Now I should point something else out. I'm using an eight times oversampling right now. Ableton's limiter does not support oversampling at all. So if I put this back on off, take a listen. Let's go ahead 
Let's go ahead and crank it all the way up. So even though we're really taxing the CPU here, we're getting a really, really loud and strong mix out of this limiter, right? So it's nice to have this feature. That's something that Ableton's limiter doesn't, doesn't have. Okay, so let's talk about one last thing, and that is metering. If you are limiting, what are you doing? You're working with loudness. If you don't have a loudness meter, then what are you doing? You don't know what your loudness target is. And if you don't know what your loudness target is, then it's hard to make good decisions. Having a limiter that has an LUFS meter on it is a really useful thing. What is LUFS? It's essentially a measurement of loudness. It stands for loudness units at full scale. And all the streaming services actually have different loudness ratings that they want your music to be at when you submit them, okay? So it's a really good idea to use an LUFS meter so you know what kind of mix loudness that you're going for. And of course, FabFilter Pro L2 has it built right in and you can change whether it's a short term or whether it's integrated, meaning it'll listen to the music longer or shorter to give you your result. All right, so again, this is something that Ableton's limiter does not feature, and it just kind of makes it hard to make good decisions, right? Awesome. So that's why I look at Pro L2 as a much more robust limiting solution, and hopefully that kind of uh, demystifies some of the reasons why Ableton's limiter is a great limiter for live use, right? Because yeah, you can crank down the look ahead time to 1.5 milliseconds and go to town. But when it comes to professionally mastering your music and trying to get it as loud as you can with as little bit of distortion as you can, you gotta reach for a better limiter. And in my situation, I really love Pro L2. Awesome. Okay, so in the last video, I showed how you can use Ableton Saturator as a nice full featured clipper. You can transparently clip signals and save headroom in your mixes. I still maintain that no matter what folks say in the comments, that Ableton Saturator used as a clipper is all the clipper that you'll ever need if you know what you're doing. However, if you're using a clipper to actually hear the added harmonics, or in other words, you're using a clipper as a saturator, Ableton Saturator falls a bit short. There are some dedicated saturator plugins out there that have a leg up on sound quality, but at a price. Two prices, actually. Not only are they both a bit expensive versus other plugins, but in order to beat Ableton Saturator, they're comparatively resource hungry. We'll start with my all time favorite sounding saturator, and that's Decapitator by Sound Toys. This glorious plugin is my favorite color box. Like all saturation, it has the ability to take a sterile and boring sound and bring it to life. It's also a great saturator for folks who are adding their first external distortion plugin because it's really hard to make a setting on it that sounds really bad. Sure, you can push it to extremes, but even those extremes sound pretty great. Let's check it out. Okay, so here's this bass line again, and I've taken off any of those sidechain ducking solutions, and let's go ahead and listen to the signal bypass, and then I'm gonna add Decapitator. So let's go ahead and look at what is going on here. Essentially, you have an input drive and you have an output level. And as I turn up drive, you can see that the output is actually getting turned down due to this handy little auto switch. Now, like I said before, Decapitator is great for people that don't know what they're doing <laughs> because it essentially tries to compensate for how much drive you add. And of course, an auto compensation is not going to be aware of the source material, so it can only do that good of a job. It's better to dial this in by ear yourself, but it's actually gonna be doing a decent job of at least getting you somewhere close, okay? So with zero distortion, it sounds like this. And I'll go ahead and make the mix totally wet. And so you can hear on this first algorithm, we have a really pleasing breakup. It sounds like we're playing this uh, bass line through like an amplifier or something. It sounds really good. And you also have this punish control, which is pretty funny. And I think it just adds a huge amount of gain to the drive. And then you get this like just wild, crazy sound. Just uh, no matter what you do with Decapitator, I always like the result. It sounds really nice. Now, of course, we have a high cut and a low cut. If the high cut's all the way up, right, but you can dial those back. And it's got a really uh, gentle slope, but you can change that slope here. Now that's a decent sound. So what I can do is I can pull my mix all the way down to dry and then just bring this back in until I like it, right? Now 
Now, that's a pretty extreme setting. Another thing we could do is do a, a, a little bit less of an extreme setting, something like this. I'll go ahead and zero it out. Okay, I've got a decent sound. Now I can pull my mix all the way down and bring it back in. Let's go ahead and A-B this. Just a beautiful sound. It's really easy to get a nice result with Decapitator. Now, even though Decapitator is my favorite saturator, it's not the plugin that I reach for most often when adding harmonics. The reason being is that there's an even better and more flexible saturation tool that has the widest application for the most diverse set of sounds, and that's Saturn 2 by FabFilter. Let's check it out. Okay, so here's an instance of Saturn 2, and we just have a very, very light amount of drive on this signal. Let's take a listen. At the moment, it's just adding the most subtle amount of distortion, right? Let's go ahead and crank up the drive. Now, that's a really pleasing sound, but I want to show you something, and this is why I think Saturn 2 is such a great solution. We can see the fundamental pitch kind of happening here, and then we can see the harmonics, because this is a frequency spectrum, right? The really rad thing we can do with, with Saturn 2 is we can actually use multiple bands. It's a multi-band distortion, meaning that we can distort different bands at different levels using different distortion algorithms. It's incredible. So let's go ahead and split this up. I'm going to go ahead and, and watch the signal come in and try to dial in where I feel like the fundamental frequency is. And you can, you can handily solo okay, the different bands. Let's go ahead and just solo the lower band and move this around until we like it. Perfect. So this is the fundamental frequency, and then up here we have the harmonics. Awesome. So now we can distort these separately. So let's go ahead and listen to this one and get this dialed in. We could probably use a more aggressive thing. We could probably go with like heavy saturation. <laughs> let's listen to this. Now, that might be over the top, and you can hear a lot of bright signal in there. That's because Essentially, when you're distorting something, even though we have this soloed, we are creating upper harmonics. Now, we can deal with those in many different ways. One thing we could do is we could use this uh, EQ here, and, these, and you have a different EQ for each one of your bands. So I'm going to pull the, the brightest band all the way down. Nice. That's more of a gentle curve for my, my top end brightness. Now, I'm going to go over to this side. I'm going to solo this out. Let's take a listen to this. We could use a different algorithm. Maybe we want to use a warm tube. Now, conversely, I can pull down some bass here, okay, and then I can allow this bass that I'm making here, the harmonics I'm making here, to take over that sound, and then I can work with the top end instead. Right? So let's go ahead and turn off solo and take a listen to what we've got now. <laughs> so we've fundamentally changed the way that this bass line sounds. So not only are we using Saturn 2 as a saturator, but we're also able to add some like interesting sound design with it, right? Now another thing we can do is we can adjust the levels here. So we can actually turn bands down and up. And of course we can compensate by adding some output gain. Okay, so I admit that this is a really extreme setting, but I'm using these extreme settings to show you what's possible. If I was actually mixing this, I'm gonna go back to this one. I would turn this drive way down. That's pretty nice. And then I would go to my mix and I would turn this all the way down and bring it up till I like it. Cool, so without it, with it. Now let's go ahead and A, B this, the difference just for the heck of it. I'm going to use my Z key. Now, of course, these are very, very different distortion profiles. So this is just a matter of taste, right? But these are both adding color and interest to a relatively boring bass line. We can hear that, even though this says effects rack, this is decapitator. We can hear that decapitator is actually a little bit louder. So I'm going to turn up the output gain here on Saturn. 
Let's go up to maybe 5 dB, and this will probably be a good spread. Right, so again, I don't reach for Decapitator a lot because I find that Saturn II just has a wider applicability to a wider set of sounds. You can get as many bands as you want here. You can add some, I don't know what the upward limit is. Let's find out. Yeah, you can add up to six bands here. It's incredible, right? So yeah, it's a really flexible tool. And one more thing I should say about Saturn II is that you have these variable oversampling qualities. I believe this is like times eight and this is like times 32 oversampling. And I believe that there's also some oversampling happening in Decapitator, but it, it's not an option that you can change, I don't think anyway. Uh, if there is a way to, to change the uh, oversampling option in Decapitator, let me know in the comments. But yeah, those are my two saturators that I really enjoy, that I really believe are a step up from Ableton saturation. Okay, so the next thing I wanna go over is a sequencer. It would be inaccurate to say that Ableton doesn't have a sequencer. In fact, I'd say that Ableton has one of the best and most influential sequencers ever designed, its piano roll. And it's a really pretty good one at that. The sheer amount of people using Ableton's piano roll across the world and its clip system is staggering. But if anything, that lends itself to my next point. How a human interacts with an instrument greatly informs the music that comes out the other end. Like if you had a trumpet, you'd make totally different music than if you had a piano or if you had a guitar. It's the same with sequencers. If you've never used a sequencer outside of the piano roll, you're in for a serious treat. Whether you're looking for inspiration or simply a way to make music in new ways, taking a sequencer out for a ride is something every modern musician owes to themselves. Now, my go-to outboard plug-in sequencer is definitely Polymath by Novel Music. Let's check it out. Okay, so here's Polymath, and you can see that it is sequencing an operator, and it's on this track, and you see that there are no notes in this track. That's because I'm using Polymath to generate the notes instead of the piano roll, okay? Take a listen. Now, you might be thinking, wow, that's really, really unremarkable and extremely boring, and you're right. But what makes Polymath so interesting is that you can use it to create random results that are really, really musical. Now here you can see we've got our notes, and if I turn up deviation, take a listen. Now we're starting to move around and we're leaving the, that original sequence every once in a while by using this deviate. Deviate essentially will add a percentage of randomization, but it's locked to a scale, okay? Now, if I go over to all these other features, I can add deviation to each one of these. So let's deviate this one, this is the octave. Let's go to velocity, we're gonna deviate velocity. Then duration, now this is a really nice one because some notes will be very short and other notes will be very long. Now all of these are really fun, but let's go to mod. In mod, I'm gonna start adding deviate and this is really gonna set this thing off. So what the hell is going on here? <laughs> well, essentially you can use Polymath to go to actual parameters. And so you can see that I've got some parameters going on here, such as a frequency shifter. And then if we look up here, we can see that my send amount to this hybrid reverb is actually being controlled by Polymath. So now we're getting some really interesting results. So you might be listening to this and thinking, yeah, this is really nice, but it's super random. I, I need some repeatable results every once in a while. Well, the cool thing is, is that you can just slide this lock control over. Once you got something you like, it'll lock the parameters in and it will repeat itself. Check it out. Bring it back and we'll get another result. Now, if you take this lock control and slide it back this way, what's gonna happen is it's going to start to increase the random amount, but it's gonna repeat itself a lot more than it would if it was all the way over here, meaning totally random, right? So. So I look at Polymath as a really playable instrument. I'm gonna turn it up a little bit and let's put it in the mix. It's just so much fun. I love this thing. You owe it to yourself to check out a sequencer, if not polymath, some other sequencer other than just Ableton's piano roll. Awesome. 
Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is resonance suppression. Dynamic EQ or resonance reduction via Soothe, Golfos, or Rezo is one of the only actual new novel technologies available to music producers. There are many differences, and after doing my research, I like Soothe 2 the best. Let's check it out. Okay, so let's finally listen to this track. Take a listen to this. <laughs> okay, so essentially what's happening here is I'm using Ableton Echo and I'm turning the feedback up so that I can get kind of like a dub delay. Now, this feedback sounds cool and it's really fun, but it's kind of getting a really uh, annoying frequency in there. Let's take a listen to this. Now, Let's go ahead and listen to the difference that using Soothe 2 can do. I'm not going to show you the Soothe 2 just yet, but let's just listen to what it does. Now let's listen without it. Okay, so what's going on here? <laughs> Essentially what Soothe 2 is doing is it's listening to the incoming signal and it's determining where there may be resonance, okay, or long-lasting notes that could be annoying, right? In this situation, around this area, around 1.6, we have this echo that's making uh, this repeated sound and it's kind of building up energy over time and getting to be a little bit out of control. And this is a great application of where you can use Soothe 2 to fix that, right? So without it, right with it so essentially what soothe 2 can do for you is if you have a track that's kind of wiling out and it's got a lot of resonances and peaky sounds that are just kind of annoying it's great and it's really easy to dial in where that frequency might be so essentially what you can do is you can put soothe 2 on a track and you can find where there might be some resonances that are bad we can see that it's showing me okay there's a lot of signal right here And right now it's reducing that signal, which is nice, but I can make it reduce it even more by adding a little bit more by using this as kind of like a dynamic EQ and saying the higher that this is, the more sensitive Soothe 2 will be to that frequency range, right? <laughs> Let it take off. Right? Cool, so let's go ahead and add this in the mix without the sequence for now. Cool, so hopefully you can see the immediate utility of a plugin like this. Now again, just like with Track Spacer, you could set this up yourself. I could make myself uh, an EQ8 and I could automate the dipping of a gain on a signal, but again, Soothe 2 is just a faster solution and a more robust solution for the same thing. We also have a couple extras. We have the ability to oversample. Yet again, if there's some distortion happening, we can oversample. Another thing we can do is we can turn on Delta, and essentially what this does is we can listen to the difference. Okay, so this is what Soothe 2 is actually removing. Right? <laughs> There's also two different modes here that you can experiment with and a bunch of really useful presets to get you started, right? It's a great plugin. Cool, so that's my short list of plugins that I really feel like can help round out Ableton. If there's a plugin that you feel like I missed, definitely go leave it in the comments because I'd like to see what you think about it. Now, if I had more time in this video, I would have went over some more, especially uh, FabFilter Pro Q3 versus Ableton's EQ8 and why it's such an amazing tool, especially for referencing. I might make that in another video if there's enough demand for that. But anyway, I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you like this kind of thing, like, comment, subscribe. Much love, everybody. I'll see you next time.